prophecy unfolding, the current Pope, the false church, and the great warning. By Catholic theologian, Dr. Kelly Bowring. Darkness is descending over the world and it is only going to get darker. The final battle of the book of Revelation is unfolding as the signs of the times are making clear. And God has given us the complete battle plan for victory through his biblical and private revelation, which reveals to us the coming secrets, chastisement, and triumph of Jesus and his mother in these end times. These are the end times. The Catholic Church has been betrayed within its own corridors. The Church has lost its way and is plunging into darkness. This has been foretold, and it is the sign of the end times. The last Pope has emerged, and according to prophecy, the world is being lost under the misguided direction of this biblical false prophet, Pope. Evil seems to be the victor, and darkness our final end. We have been warned. This is the final battle prophesied in the Bible's book of Revelation and warned about through the church's history by saints, popes, holy mystics, and Marian apparitions. From Blessed Paul VI's warning that the darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church even to its summit, to St. Malachi's famous prophecy, with its proven sound prophetic reference to various popes mentioned in its history, which states unequivocally that Pope Benedict is the last pope on earth and that after him, St. Peter the Roman, the first pope, would rule the church from heaven as the church of Rome is destroyed just before the second coming of Christ to judge the world. And how this is definitively a wake-up call that should give us shivers according recently to the Vatican's papal secretary. To St. Francis of Assisi's prophecy that in the final tribulation, which by all accounts has begun, a destroyer would be raised to the pontificate canonically elected invalidly, who by his cunning will draw many into error and schisms. To Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich's amazing and telling vision about how, as the great tribulation begins, a secret sect will undermine the Church of Peter until there will be two popes, with one coming specifically from the Southern Hemisphere, of which, as a matter of fact, Pope Francis is the first pope in history, who will be a Judas, the false prophet, building the false church that will embrace all heterodoxies and creeds into one. To St. Faustina's descriptions of the great warning in the time of mercy being granted to prepare the world for Christ's second coming and her ominous writing in her diary that her worst day of suffering where she felt as if she was in Gethsemane where Jesus was betrayed by Judas was the same exact day Pope Francis was born on December 17, 1936. To the remarkable and factual Maria Divine Mercy prophecy that Pope Benedict would resign under manipulated duress and exactly one year later to the day he announced his resignation. To Venerable Fulton Sheen's prophecy about the final Pope, a Judas Iscariot Pope who will be the false prophet recruited by Satan from among the bishops, who will build the ape of the church, the false church on earth, which will look similar to the true church in every way, but be devoid of all grace and salvation. To Leo XIII's vision of Satan arguing with Jesus and the hundred years reign of Satan that came afterwards with his gift of the St. Michael prayer to help the faithful fight back in these apocalyptic times. To servant of God, Luisa Picaretta's prophecy that during this time, the church's greatest enemies would be her own children, especially from among her priests, who have become ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. To St. John Paul II's pre-papal prophecy that we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced, the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, gospel and the anti-gospel, 
between Christ and the Antichrist. To the Catechism's declaration that before Christ's second coming, the church must pass, pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers when she will follow her Lord into his death and resurrection. To Our Lady of America's warning of possible nuclear war and America's divine call to lead the world to peace. To Garibandal's threefold prophecy of the great warning, the great miracle, and the divine chastisement that the visionary said will begin when communism, led by Russia, comes back a second time. To Blessed Elena's prophecy that Russia will march upon and overrun all the nations of Europe, particularly Italy, and will raise her flag over the Dome of St. Peter's while her secret armies battle America. To Fatima's prophecy that Russia will spread her errors into every country, raising up wars and persecution against the church while destroying many nations and its dire prediction of the martyrdom of a pope. To St. John Bosco's dream of the church being overtaken by her enemies from within and the martyrdom of a pope. To St. Pius X's prophecy that one of his successors of the same name, which by the way he shares with Pope Benedict, both being named Joseph, will flee Rome over the bodies of his brethren, take refuge in some hiding place, and after a brief respite will die a cruel death. To Magigoria's famous ten secrets of divinely sourced events, soon to unfold, one after the other, each pre-announced publicly a few days before they occur. To St. Hildegard's vision of the last days, and in particular, the details of the Antichrist. To La Salette's forewarning that in the last days, hell will reign on earth, as Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist while the church is eclipsed because the visionary told us we will not know which is the true Pope and the holy sacrifice of the Eucharist will cease to be offered in churches. To Father Gobi, who tells us that the ten horns of the beast is the promotion of the ten anti-commandments against God's ten commandments and his seven heads are the promotion of the seven capital vices against the seven great moral and theological virtues. So that the world will be driven by Satan along the road of disobedience to the Lord, becoming submerged in sin, and thus prevented from receiving the gifts of grace and eternal life. To Akita's warning that the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that we will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishop, bishops against bishops, and not just good leaders against bad leaders, but also orthodox leaders against misguided orthodox leaders. And that God will then inflict a terrible punishment greater than the flood on all humanity, when fire will fall from heaven and will wipe out a great part of the human race. To Blessed Anna Maria Taigi's prophecy that just before Christ returns, God will send two punishments, one in the form from man of wars and the other in the form from heaven of the three days of darkness, when all the enemies of the church, whether known or unknown, will perish over the whole earth. To Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora's revelations about the new paradise after the purifying punishments that will cause a beautiful new splendor over the earth when God will be reconciled with mankind and the church will finally enter her great millennial restoration and triumph of peace. To Mary's promise at Fatima that in the end her immaculate heart will triumph and the world will enter the era of peace. To Catherine Labouré's Rudebach vision of the coming unification and new reign of the two hearts of Jesus and Mary. 
to St. Louis de Montfort's prophecy that the greatest saints in the history of the church will be those who consecrate, consecrated to Mary in the end times will help her and St. Michael to defeat and crush the head of the evil one and cast him into hell forever. To the Bible's book of Revelation declaration that the devil who has deceived humanity will be cast into the lake of fire along with the Antichrist and the false prophet Pope to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And its promise that then Jesus will come again in his glory to wipe every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the older order will have passed away. As, as the one who sat on the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. And a new heavens and a new earth and a universal restoration for a millennium of peace where God will dwell with humanity as he did with Adam and Eve before the fall. Yes, all of these prophecies are now unfolding in this very moment in history, each perfectly and one after the other. And the ongoing fulfillment and unfolding of these prophecies of our times are batting a thousand. This is simply a fact and cannot be refuted. A new level of credibility is established here regarding prophecy. This shows us that if the Catholic prophecies related to the last few years have all come true, which they have, then most probably the prophecies relating to the next few years will come true as well. We can be sure that as the prophecies have already occurred, so too will they continue to occur. And while some prophecies are conditional, most are inevitable as part of God's plan and these are pre-announced by him for the good of those who will be saved. Let us be warned and listen. An invalid pope. I've been writing and speaking on Catholic prophecy for the past 10 years. Having written three highly regarded best-selling books that have sold many tens of thousands of copies and spoken at over 50 conferences tens of thousands of Catholics, always well received at all levels of the church by all, although always aggressively scorned and attacked by others at every step along the way as well. As a Catholic theologian in good standing, I begin by echoing the recent statement of loyalty to Pope Francis by the cardinals who wrote him the dubia questions, stating that I renew my dedication and love for the chair of Peter and Pope Francis in whom I recognize the successor of Peter and the vicar of Christ, as is, my, as is my baptismal duty. And while knowing it is not within my theological authority to pass judgment on him or his papal validity, otherwise now indictable and in question, being also deeply in love with the church and staunchly loyal to the apostolic see, my theological responsibility induces me to continue my work of discussing analysis of solid Catholic prophecy and the signs of the times, including how these might include Pope Francis. Even more, my conscience impels me to keep doing this, and I pray yours will you as well. The Church teaches that a theologian may, according to the case, raise questions regarding the timeliness, form, even the contents of magisterial interventions. And the Christian faithful as well have the right and even at times the duty to manifest the sacred to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinion on matters which pertain to the good of the church and to make their opinions known to the rest of the Christian faithful according to canon law even if it's controversial or unpopular it is even clearly established that at times we have a right and duty to resist the pope as cardinal burke responded when asked what he would do if and when Pope Francis changes the doctrine of the faith, saying, I will resist. He continued, It's always my sacred duty to defend the truth of the church's teaching. Therefore, if any authority, even the highest authority, 
were to deny that truth or act contrary to it, I would be obliged to resist. I would like to discuss private revelation and the prophecies of the end times that are going to be fulfilled in the next few months and years. The church teaches in her catechism that private revelations are given by God to help us live more fully by Christ's definitive revelation in a certain period in history. These regarding the end times. I've been writing books, analyzing, applying, and reporting on biblical and Catholic private revelation-based prophecy theologically for the past 10 years. And I can say it is now clear to see that the prophecies I have been reporting on are all of them, one after the other, coming true. And many already have. And many more now will. Indeed, it is too painful to imagine that God would allow the Pope to deny any truth of the faith and put himself in the place of God. But a false Pope? Maybe. Prophecy indicates this is happening right now. First, prophecy said that Pope Benedict would resign, and he did, at least in part. Second, prophecy said that Pope Benedict was manipulated to resign. And two years after his resignation, according to Father Silvano Fosti, Cardinal Martini's confessor and spiritual guide, Martini put manipulated pressure on Benedict XVI eight months before he resigned the papacy, declaring the time had come for him to resign because the Roman Curia seemed irreformable, saying to the Holy Father, the Curia is not going to change. You have no choice but to resign the papacy. Third, prophecy said that the Pope after Pope Benedict, the last Pope on earth, would be elected invalidly through the conspiring of a secret coup. And two and a half, two and a half years after Francis' election, Cardinal Daniels confessed on numerous occasions publicly that he and his St. Gallen Mafia club of other cardinals, including Casper, Martini, Hume, and Silvestrini, seeking a drastic mar modern modernist reform of the church, engaged in a 10-year-long tactical and strategic self-dubbed mafia club and shadow council to make Pope Francis the head of the church, and did just that in getting their man, Pope Francis, elected. Other bishops, including the Swiss and German bishops, have since confirmed this mafia club existed. What is most important to note here is that I analyzed and reported these prophecies in my writings five, six, seven, eight years ago. And at the time, most refused to believe they were authentic. Even as the prophecy of Pope Benedict's resignation was coming true, as Pope Francis was elected, in what seemed like a legitimate Vatican conclave of cardinals, I was publicly denounced and these prophecies rebuked. And now, two to four years later, it has come out that all of these prophecies were true. There are two points of church teaching concerning the prophecies and now testimony related to Pope Francis's papal invalidity to consider here. First, the church teaches that if a pope is elected by a group of cardinals who conspire to have him elected, then he is de facto automatically invalid. Second, no one is permitted, even if he is a cardinal, to make plans concerning the election of a pope's successor, or to promise votes, or to make decisions in this regard in private gatherings of a papal conclave. Should the conditions laid down here not be observed, or should the election of a pope take place in a way other than prescribed by the church's constitution, the church teaches that such papal election would be, for this very reason, null and void, without any need for a declaration on the matter. Consequently, it confers no right on the pope elected. Such an elected pope is automatically invalid without any need for 
adjudication by anyone, including the Magisterium or co College of Cardinals. He's objectively a false pope. This indeed is too difficult for many, if not most Catholics, to grasp, much less concede or unite together to address. And without a leader to guide us, we're now fighting amongst ourselves about it. According to prophecy, we have a false pope who's poisoning the souls of the faithful by deceitfully and cunningly changing the sacred doctrine of Jesus into satanic doctrines of damnation while usurping Christian morality. And this more and more until he'll take away the very sacrifice of the mass of our redemption. And now that it's been established, there's a lot of proof that this is true from other sources besides prophecy. It's important to note that even if we were, he were validly elected, he has since invalidated himself through doctrinal disbelief and the promotion of errors. It has been clearly established that if an otherwise valid pope holds or teaches a heresy in regard to even one doctrine of the faith, then he de facto invalidates his papacy. It has also been clearly established that Pope Francis, among other heretical leanings, like in regard to contraception and homosexuality, agrees with the heresies related to allowing communion for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics. This is demonstrated by his letter to the Buenos Aires bishops on interpreting Amoris Laetitia and from the testimony of the Pope's position from Cardinal Marx, as well as from the Cardinal in the Vatican in charge of interpreting legal texts, and from numerous articles in the Vatican's newspapers, and from the Maltese bishops, who all give testimony that he has this and has taken this position. And now that the dam of doctrine has been pierced at the highest level, the floodgates of heresies are spreading openly and insidiously everywhere almost overnight. So on the papal election coup, and on his own promoting of heresy, prophecies that Pope Francis is an invalid pope seem to have been correct and have now demonstrably come true. And as prophecy has come true, so will it continue to come true. Prophecy states, the false church of the false prophet pope. It has now become clear with prophecy and mounting evidence that Pope Benedict was ousted from the seat of Peter by devious means and has been forced to walk a terrible path in disgrace through no fault of his own. Like Christ, he will now be whipped, sneered at, and made to look foolish. He's been deceived terribly. He is in a prison, harsher than any actual prison. And prophecy says things will get worse for him. And he'll have to flee Rome before the great warning. And from exile will lead the remnant until he suffers a cruel death. Pope Francis is the last pope. And there is no prophecy anywhere that says there will be another pope after him or that he will be successfully deposed. It actually is clear to the contrary. In fact, everything in prophecy points and states that he will nearly succeed in destroying the Catholic Church. While he is the man who sits in the chair of Peter, he is not from God, but is, according to prophecy, the false prophet of the book of Revelation. And the Bible says his task is to prepare the world for the Antichrist. In the opposite way that St. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus Christ. To get things ready, he's initiating the diabolical plan to destroy the Catholic Church from within, tampering with the teachings of Christ and trying to destroy our allegiance to God by denouncing his teachings, twisting his doctrine until it becomes heresy. Though he's the leader of the Catholic Church on earth, he's working deceitfully to change the Church's teaching and the Word of God to present the newly renovated modern Church. He is the right hand of the beast. A new church that abandons doctrine and promotes sin. The schism in the Catholic Church, so long prophesied, has begun. There has arisen two churches, and one is seeking to destroy and replace the other. The head of Christ on earth has been deviously and deceptively replaced 
by the head of the serpent from hell, just as the book of Revelation warned, according to prophecy. Though this current pope was elected by members within the Catholic Church, he's the false prophet and an imposter and invalid pope who has a secret agenda of promoting disloyalty to the church's teachings and promoting a false doctrine of tolerance to sin. The plan by the false prophet pope to deceive the world's clergy has begun. Jesus' teachings are now being attacked by this pope in the first of many challenges, which will result in the prophesied great schism of the church. The faithful will continue to be pulled in two different directions. These divisions will increase until finally all God's children will have to make a choice. They'll either follow the false illusion presented by the false prophet who says that he speaks in the name of God, but with disguised double talk to deceive even many of the faithful, or they will choose to follow the truth of Christ and his word. Half will follow the false prophet out of misguided duty or fear. Others filled with the Holy Spirit and given graces of discernment who know that an imposter now sits in the church of Rome will see clearly how he schemes to denounce the teachings of Christ and authentic Marian devotion as he hates Mary as much as Jesus will now follow him into his schism but will, will now not follow him into his schism but will remain faithful to the true church as a remnant. The remnant faithful will then unite and rise to spread the gospels when they will have been pushed to one side as the schism takes place by the false prophet. Many cardinals, bishops, priests, nuns, and ordinary people will be falsely and invalidly excommunicated as they rightly refuse to follow the new rules or adore the false prophet. At this stage, the remnant faithful will have to seek out refuges. Again, this sounds radical and an unreality even just a few years ago, but now many who have been rejecting these messages until now are starting to see the awful truth as they are witnessing the blasphemies which are now being poured from the mouth of the current Pope just as prophecy indicated would occur. And just as Jesus was crucified, so too will his church on earth now be crucified by the false prophet and the Antichrist. Benedict will suffer greatly until his dying breath. And as the church is being crucified, all its disciples, just as it was with Jesus' apostles, will be nowhere to be seen. They'll go into hiding for fear of reprisals. In the hour of the church's greatest crisis, those who should speak will remain silent. Our Lady of Good Success warned. But the voice of the imposter, the false prophet, will ring out across the world. Rome will lose the faith. And soon Jesus' presence will no longer grace the altars within his church. The Eucharist will no longer be celebrated validly, and the doorway will be open for Rome to become the seat of the Antichrist. Yes, become the seat of the Antichrist. It will be then that God's hand in chastisement will fall in punishment. This is when the battle of Armageddon will begin, wherein God will thwart the plans of the two deceivers and lend a divine hand of aid to his faithful. The crucifixion of Christ's church must come about because of the final covenant to purify and sanctify humanity so that then the glorious resurrection of the church, the new Jerusalem, will wipe away all the tears, all the suffering, and usher in the thousand-year era of peace. You must decide whose side you are on, or you will soon find yourself on the wrong side by default. Beware. The false prophet is seducing many, charming many, convincing many that he represents the truth. You must now show your allegiance to Christ. Make no mistake, as God's word is tampered with, the truth is being torn asunder. Lies are thus infesting souls. And as this is happening, people are unwittingly following a path that will end in despair because of the lies which they are being forced to swallow by the false prophet. By your fruits you shall know them. And four and a half years of this pontificate prove his fruit is rotten to the core. 
He is spreading lies with pride and contempt in his heart as he tries to create a new church. In the name of social justice and social compassion, the false prophet is setting out what the world will believe to be to evangelize and create a modern church. This church will be seen to reach out to all sinners and embrace them, but without a call to repentance or genuine conversion. The problem with this final war is that those who side with the Antichrist and the false prophet will be seen to be doing great good in the world. Priests will be required to swear to a final oath and the faithful to make a new faith pledge, which will be a form of the sacrament of confirmation, both presented by the false prophet as part of his global plan to unite all religions in the world into the new false church. The deceitful false prophet was sent by Satan to mislead the church on earth and to prepare for the reign of the Antichrist. The false prophet idolizes Satan from which he gets his dynamic power and he wants to topple the Catholic Church and break it into little pieces. A new church where the mass will become invalid. Just this week, it's been reported that Pope Francis has formed a secret commission made up of Catholics, Lutherans, and Anglicans tasked with the implementing of a new mass that will include all three denominations united together. The darkness of contamination is already upon us at our door. And this is more prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes, or should I say under our noses. Whether this will be it or soon afterwards, prophecy clearly warns that the point will soon be reached when the whole mass will no longer be valid. It will be declared to become a different kind of sacrifice to God and the faithful remnant will know instantly when it happens for the practice of the Holy Mass will be stopped by the false prophet Pope. In the place of the Holy Mass will be a one world pagan ritual and a new Mass which will really be a pagan ceremony. The day this happens is still to come and it will happen suddenly and unexpectedly so fast will the false prophet move. The moment this happens, walk away. As this darkest of days arrives, we need to gather in groups to ensure that the remnant will be able to receive the Most Holy Eucharist during the final persecution. This persecution is mainly a spiritual one. The true disciples and I mean all Christians of every denomination everywhere, will watch in great sorrow when they have to bear witness to the great deceit, which will descend fully over the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church will embrace the secular world and will, and will declare mortal sin to be no more. This is the error which was foretold and which, if God does not intervene, will lead millions into the fires of hell, led there by the false prophet and the Antichrist, his partner. Pray, pray, pray that the false prophet will be identified by competent and courageous church leaders for who he is. Pray that this message will spread. Pray for the graces required to ensure you and your loved ones will rise above the deceit of Satan in these times and overcome the darkness. Preparing for the rise of the Antichrist. The false prophet Pope is preparing for the Antichrist, who will eventually sit in the seat of Peter in Rome. The false prophet Pope, while busy with his lofty ambitions to impress the world's Catholics, will then be pushed to one side for a while, because the Antichrist will at this time enter the world stage as foretold. When you hear the media reports of a new promising skilled peace negotiator, you will know who he is. He'll be a very close ally of the false prophet and is under no illusion as to who he is, the son of Satan. The Antichrist will be from the East and speak several languages, but not a word of Latin. He'll arise to fame first as a peacemaker in Jerusalem between the Palestinians and the Jews. Hailed as a modern innovator, 
He will be received by the whole world as he will engage in great humanitarian efforts until he proclaims his solution to unite all churches into a one world religion, which will secretly pay homage to the beast. And he will condone every sin as the most influential leader of all time. The Antichrist will claim to be Christian, but he and the false prophet really idolize Satan. And the three together make up the anti-Trinity in their final battle on earth against the triune God. Large images in every kind of format of the beast will be spread, whose sign 666 will be embedded within every single mark he makes upon an unsuspecting world, particularly in the monetary microchip. This deceit has one purpose, to turn the whole world over to Lucifer, who is scheming how he can take every soul to hell before Christ's second coming. Soon the cohort of the false prophet will announce the unfolding schism before the world's media and announce the building of a new temple. The new temple dedicated to the rule of the false prophet who will succeed in spreading and separating the church's teachings from the Ten Commandments as the church is defiled by the sins planned by people who want to destroy Christianity and other religions. All will be told to embrace each other, whatever their creed, their religion, their skin color, their race, their laws. They'll all be asked to send representatives to this new temple, which will be located in Rome. They'll be told that this is the new Jerusalem prophesied in the Bible and protected by God's chosen leader, the false prophet. Then pay attention to the friendship the false prophet will display with the Antichrist, for they will be two of the most deceitful followers of Satan in history, wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. These two will bear the image of goodness, but will lead many of God's children astray through deception. They will blind many to the truth as the sweeping changes, which they will bring about throughout their reign, will detach people from the laws of God. The Antichrist, masquerading as a man of peace, will receive many awards and acknowledgement of his humanitarian works. The false prophet will be seen to be uniting the churches of the world and displaying at every opportunity all those attributes which you associate with a saint. The Antichrist will, along with the false prophet, then create a global partnership, which will be presented as the greatest humanitarian initiative. The world will applaud this new Babylon headquartered in Rome. These two will be ruthless in their quest to control all nations and anyone who dares to stand in their way will be simply ignored or destroyed. During all this time, Peter the Roman, as we know from St. Malachi's prophecy of the last popes, will rule the Catholic Church, and he will do so from heaven, as this is St. Peter himself. He will help guide Pope Benedict through these times, and the true Church, which Jesus promised not even the jaws of hell can prevail against, will remain intact through the remnant faithful who will continue adhering to the authentic magisterium and to the unchanging truth of God's word in a united remnant on earth during this final battle. When Pope Benedict goes into exile and is forced to flee the Vatican, he will still be a guide to the faithful ones and help them to see the truth for a time. Only after he's left the Vatican will the great warning occur. Only God's intervention can now help humanity. Then the great warning will suddenly occur. Our only hope at this point will be for God to intervene to save us. And God has promised through his prophecy that he will intervene. God will indeed intervene as he prophesied he will. Jesus told St. Faustina, and Our Lady told Father Gobi that the world is in such dire straits due to sin and evil today that the only hope for it is a divine intervention of God's mercy, of which it will soon receive in the form of the great warning. The warning will shock everyone. There will be great signs in the skies before the warning takes place. Stars will clash with such impact that humanity will think the spectacle they see in the sky as being catastrophic and world-ending. 
As these comets infuse, the great red sky will result and the sign of the cross will be seen all over the world by everyone. Many will be frightened, but it will be wonderful as we will see for the first time in our lives a truly divine sign from heaven that represents the great and foretold news of God's mercy for sinners everywhere. The world is about to experience the greatest act of God's mercy in history since the time of Christ's death. Every man, woman, and child over the age of reason will be shown God's mercy to bring all humanity to conversion. The warning is being granted to awaken the world, pull it from the grips of the evil one, and purify God's children in preparation for the second coming of Christ. Through it, many people will seek forgiveness for their sins, which would not have otherwise done so, and so now they will be saved. But don't wait for the warning. You must seek conversion and redemption now, before the warning, and then pray for others as it approaches. Those who still have hatred in your hearts will feel great pain and anguish during the warning. You'll experience the same pain you inflicted upon others. Make no mistake, the warning is a form of divine judgment. You will witness the same pain and suffering that you will endure when you will be cast into the fires of hell if you do not repent. Even if you find the warning excruciatingly painful, you must welcome it and use it for conversion. Yes, if you confess and admit your sins, then you'll receive God's blessing and eternal life will be restored. But if you don't, you will eventually be cast into hell. Others will experience the penance of the suffering of the pains of purgatory and they'll be purified and others will receive only a blessing because they're already fully in the state of grace. But some will even die during the warning out of shock so pray for them now. As God will intervene to help bring the world to its senses through the warning, this purification will awaken the world and finally make it able to regard and truly listen to the divine messages and prophecies of our times. It will be then that this heavenly message of which I've been speaking, rejected for the most part up until now, will be sought out, heard, and welcomed by many. Then many will realize what is going on and how the prophecies are shedding light upon the darkness of our times. Christ's great gift of mercy will destroy the effect of Satan over God's children. His gift of the warning will dilute the terror that would have continued to gain momentum were this not to take place. The warning will without question ease any such persecutions because so many will be converted. Pray now for a global conversion and to dilute any torment that will evolve during the reign of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Because as soon as the warning happens and when conversion takes place, you must move quickly to spread God's word. There's an urgency to this because this will be a crucial period. This is when, through the work of God's faithful followers everywhere, his children will be able to stay on the right path. It will be the time when prayer and conversion can dilute the impact of the havoc, which will come about through the reign of the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Catholic Church is in a grave situation. Without the intervention of God, the Blessed Mother, and Saint Michael, it would not be possible for it to be saved. But these words of Jesus will also be fulfilled. I am with you all days, even to the end of the world. Thus, there is great cause for hope. Pray for discernment to recognize Jesus' true voice when it is given to you through authentic prophets. Open your hearts now and listen to what he has to tell you through them. The prophecies contained in the book of Revelation are unfolding before our eyes. Satan will not win over the church if priests are alert by prophecy and the signs of the times to the great deceit and see it for what it is, a diabolical lie. As Paul instructs, examine everything and retain what is good. The words of the scriptures must be fulfilled. 
It is necessary that these things take place in such a way so that the world is passed through the crucible according to the prophecies of Christ himself. During these end times, defend God's word at all costs. The time for choice is close. The abomination has not yet happened, but when you see the errors which go against Christ's teachings and the gift of the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, as he founded them, altered, walk away. The day is close. Then you must gather and continue to follow the rules of the faith as a remnant church. The remnant church. In the book of Revelation, the woman gives birth to the true church, Christ's loyal flock, who will not be misled by the false prophet or antichrist. You are the church referred to in the book of Revelation. You are the product of the woman who gave birth to a male and who was cast out into the desert where you will be isolated, yet united as one, to live and proclaim God's word and preach the true gospels as a remnant in these end times. As Daniel warned, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the horrible abomination is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. And since you will not agree to participate in this, you will be cast aside into the desert for 1,260 days, where you will take refuge as a united remnant. You will have to honor Jesus in secret because the mass will change beyond recognition under the rule of this false prophet. It will be changed, twisted, and Jesus will be vilified through new laws introduced by the false prophet. You will soon be told that Holy Communion, the true presence, is in fact something else. Defend the truth of the crucifixion and the sacrifice of the Mass. Do not accept the lies or the changes in the Holy Mass and the Holy Eucharist. Many of you will become saints in the new paradise and having helped build Christ's remnant church on earth in these end times will reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth which will emerge at his second coming. What to do in these last times? Obey with targeted resistance. Though the Pope may be the false Pope or the false prophet, we do not have the competent authority to fully make this decision on our own. So we're still bound to obey unless the order touches matters of faith, morality, and charity. Just like in the U.S., in general, we obey and respect the president and all the laws, but not the unjust laws, like abortion or capital punishment. So, too, we should continue to be respectful and obedient to Pope Francis, but not to his wrongful teachings or to those errors he gives support to. We should even pro protest them, as we do the law of abortion. And after he takes the church into schism, we will then refuse to comply and instead simply remain faithful to the true magisterium and church. At that time, the faithful bishops and cardinals will also give us guidance, together with Pope Benedict. It is now the time of which Christ spoke. There will rise up many false Christs and false prophets, including among them the Antichrist and the false prophet. Many modernist bishops today are other false prophets Jesus warned us about as well. No lamb throws itself into the jaws of the wolf. One cannot give obedience to wolves. In the eyes of heaven itself, they can no longer lay claim to obedience. Pray and get ready. You must mortify yourselves and go to confession at least every four weeks. But prayer and suffering are important too. In the world of today, even the Catholic world, many have completely lost sight of the truth that suffering for others is necessary and efficacious. The fact that we are all part of the mystical body of Christ and that we must all suffer for each other has been completely forgotten. These terrible, terrible sufferings you experience in the darkness of our times are the most precious there can be and the most fruitful. 
accept whatever physical and mental suffering you receive on behalf of Christ in order to save souls in these times. And therein lies our triumph. Mary has said that she sends her children's sufferings to help save souls. So courage, do not be disheartened. In the cross lies our salvation. Victory is in the cross. The cross is stronger than the battle. Pray the family rosary daily and the chaplet in the 3 p.m. hour of mercy. Go to daily mass and weekly adoration. Remember also the importance of fasting for it keeps the deceiver at bay and makes prayer more powerful, even to help avert wars and natural disasters. Jesus alerted us that those who proclaim his end time messages will like him be scourged, deemed to be wicked men and false prophets and ignored and rejected. But Jesus promises he will lead us along the way to his kingdom and others through us and our reward will be great. As long as you trust completely in his love and his holy will, saying, Jesus, I trust in you and thy will be done. Consecrate your family. Consecrate yourself and your families to the two hearts of Jesus and Mary at this time. Hang a picture of them prominently in your home. God has assigned the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Mediatrix of all graces, to bring humanity into the Sacred Heart of Jesus in order to save the world from the works of Satan in these last days. Trust him. Do what he's asking. Don't be deterred. Many will try to stop you from listening to prophecy and this heavenly message through the spreading of lies and confusion. So be on guard and do not listen to them. Never fear the future, for once you remain close to Jesus and Mary, you will be protected and given the necessary graces to prepare your souls and those of your families for the new era of peace foretold so long ago that is almost upon us. It is now most necessary for some courageous priests and bishops and cardinals to stand up. Many are only wormwood and rottenness, but some are still faithful and courageous. It's time to take a stand. The good people are even fighting with each other in this rudderless confusion. It used not to be like that. Formerly the good were united, but confusion has now begun and is heading toward its climax and it will become even worse. We must recognize this and organize ourselves under the faithful priests and bishops. Stand your ground for Christ. Above all, reject the lies which are being presented to you by the false prophet and soon the Antichrist. Priests, stop remaining silent when it comes to defending Jesus' teachings as the false prophet Pope mocks his church unmercifully the crown of thorns is being placed on the church right now. And this is your final call to stand by Christ and his church in this moment. Spread this message of God's prophecy for our times. The book of Revelation itself commends those who listen to and specifically spread the final prophecies, saying, blessed are you who receive, live, and spread this prophetic message of the book of Revelation and the end times prophecies. Our Lady said to Blessed Elena, launch at once this message into the world. Publish this message. Transmit these warnings and prophecies to all. Our Lady as well said to Elizabeth Kindleman, this must be your only purpose in life. At this point, spread this message, pass it on to others. I will bind Satan to the degree that you spread it. People listen to it. It depends on you, she said. 
She said, help me. We can save the world together. Thus says prophecy about what is unfolding right now and about what heaven is calling us to do. My calling and mission. I have written previously on how I was called to this mission of the theological work on prophecy by Jesus and his mother 10 years ago. And only after two years of putting my calling to the test through solid priestly spiritual direction and meetings with Vatican officials and finally receiving an imprimatur and also after receiving many signal graces and other confirmations did I move forward to publish my work. From then until today, I've continued this work in good standing and with continued official Vatican recognition for all of my three books on prophecy of which this article and video summarizes today. I continue to be supported by theologians and cardinals, though mostly in a Nicodemus styled way. On the other hand, I've been publicly dishonored, insulted, treated as a deceiver, unrecognized and ignored, falsely accused with harsh public ridicule, persecuted and abandoned. I was deviously removed from my academic position without cause. And when I approached the local Episcopal leader asking him to intervene several years ago, he responded in email correspondences, which I still have, making it clear that it was all about him not liking my writings on prophecy, even despite them having received a church imprimatur from a respected cardinal. He then promptly offered me six months full salary pay and benefits if I would agree to forego any just recourse and simply go away quietly. Given I had a large family of 10 that were all dependent on my one income, I agreed and went away quietly. More recently, the same church leader seems to have awoken to the problems coming out of the Vatican, of which Marian prophecy had warned and of which my writings had addressed. But whether he now gives Mary credit for giving the prophecy about these things beforehand or considers my writings on prophecy now redeemed, I do not know. So there I was, now an unemployed Orthodox Catholic theologian whose current area of expertise was controversial writings on prophecy, regardless that they were solid and well regarded. Not a lot of job prospects. My career and source of livelihood was over, at least for now. And if that was not enough, soon after I moved with my family back to what I thought was a safe haven close to friends, one night I was suddenly awoken about 3 a.m. and besieged by Satan himself, who pressed himself physically against my chest and in an unmasked fashion, with his face inches from mine, he made clear to me that he was declaring war on me and taunting me. Also said aloud that he would now destroy my family. Satan himself decided to step directly into the already fray of my life at this point. He, of course, has tried to stop my work and has done everything he can to prevent me from fulfilling this mission over the years. And I can say that I have had a sense of his mischievous attacks and interference from time to time over the years, and sometimes quite outright. But never anything like this all out in my face, unmasked, direct physical attack, and threat of harm to my family. A moment later, I immediately awoke my wife and told her all that had just happened and asked her to pray with me and to get ready. Get ready for what? I had no idea. And looking back, can say truthfully that I really had no idea what was coming and how bad things would get. I soon, I soon told what had happened to me that night to a few close friends and asked for their prayers. Within a few weeks, Pope Benedict resigned and Pope Francis was elected. Within a couple more weeks, a local priest 
came one night unannounced into a large prayer group I had been leading weekly for many years. And he proceeded to break up the group and openly attack me under false pretenses. As news of this priest's action spread and confusion mounted, all our friends soon abandoned me and my family. We were cast out of our Catholic community of which I had served as teacher and leader for many years. But I have been consoled by Jesus' words. The time will come when whoever kills you will believe he is doing a holy duty for God. And that was just the beginning. To keep it simply stated, Satan then attacked and destroyed my family, as he had threatened to do. I admit that I could not have even imagined that God would have allowed what has occurred, but I know that his ways are not our ways, and that he brings good out of all things for those who love him. I also know that he has requested our sufferings to help save souls in these times. And so I've offered up these past several years' sufferings every day for souls. I also admit I probably would have been shaken in my own faith at what I've witnessed happen to my family had not the Lord given me a clear promise that in the end he would intervene to bring my family through these trials to safe harbor in his peace and reward. And so my family and I have lost everything and suffer all forms of diabolic attacks and mayhem. My testimony is true. Yes, this is what happened. And I've asked myself, why would the devil do this unless my work was that much of a threat to him and his end time plan to destroy the church and steal souls from God? I ask myself even today, why was Satan himself so threatened by my work? Why would he attack me so boldly and so unmasked directly to my face unless I was right? Unless my writings were solid and accurate? Unless I indeed had unmasked him and his diabolic plan first? I'm amazed to even still be alive. And I am dependent upon God for everything. As Paul reminds us, this is all so that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. And so I pray to say with St. Paul, we're afflicted in every way, but not constrained, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we are not discouraged. And to God be the praise. A final warning. Behold, now is a very acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Beware. All of this must come to pass, whether you believe it or not. For it is contained in the book of Revelation and has been announced in the prophecies from God. It is better to believe. Beware. If you try to stop this message of the Lord, who is sending it to save us from the evil one, then you will be responsible for the souls lost and will suffer greatly. It is better to spread this heavenly message and help God to save souls. Beware. Those who give their allegiance to the false prophet with a docile acceptance more easily will also fall for the appealing demeanor of the Antichrist. It is better to rightly be alerted to what is unfolding in our times and to fight this battle with the weapons God has given us for victory. As Romans 10 tells us, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Remind yourselves 
of Jesus' promise to come again on the great and glorious day of his second coming. Know too that in these years leading up to it, that all those who follow him will face terrible trials. This final battle is indeed upon us and will not end until his second coming. If Mary could still weep, she still does weep during her apparitions, but if she could still weep in heaven, the whole earth would be drenched with her tears. She still has pity for us miserable sinners. In her compassion, she tries to call us back or hold us back from sin. But men don't want it. They go blindly, throwing themselves into sin and into hell, even after all the miracles and all the Marian apparitions and all of her messages. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is queen of the universe. And God has decreed in the book of Revelation that she will crush the head of the serpent. The time for the triumph of Mary's immaculate heart, together with the new reign of the sacred heart of Jesus, is close. All God's children must enter through their act of Marian consecration into the new ark, which is not a boat in these times, but is the bright and safe refuge of Mary's immaculate heart. Because the final trial that has come upon us is very great, and many are all being called to suffer with her to prepare the new times when Jesus will come in his splendor and glory and will restore his reign in the new heavens and the new earth. And God promises that you will no longer be troubled if you enter Mary's immaculate heart and into the sacred heart of Jesus through her heart. A new day will soon dawn. God will intervene in these dark times with warnings, miracles, and chastisements to purify humanity and purge the world of sin and evil, to prepare for his new kingdom. Satan may boast his victory for a time as he's brought sin into souls and division into families and into the church, especially through the false prophet and antichrist, but the devil will not win. The prophecies are clear and give us hope. The new kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven will soon commence as we win this final battle. So fight, children of the light. Be the light that dispels the darkness of our times and helps Jesus and his mother usher in the new day of the era of peace. Please pray for me and my family and for my new book on the Great Warning, which a prominent Catholic publisher asked me to write that will be available soon to offer a donation for this work to continue to obtain my books or to read a transcript of this video, go to twoheartspress.com. I'm united with you in prayer in the love of the two hearts and the divine will. God bless you. And Jesus give you his peace. Amen.